Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Understanding T-Cell Responses in Tuberculosis, Latest Research on Quantifuron TB Gold Plus, presented by Jeff Boyle, Ph.D., Senior Director, Product and Assay Development, North America's Kyogen. I am Christina Mahalik of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Kyogen. For more information about our sponsor, visit Kyogen.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time you want during the presentation. Just click on the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We will answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the screen icon located on the lower right. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This presentation is educational and thus offers continuing education credits. Please click on the button in the bottom left corner and follow the process to obtain your credits. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Boyle. I will now turn the presentation over to him. Okay, terrific. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to, uh, to speak to you today about our latest uh, product in the Quantifuron uh, TB uh, Gold uh, uh, product line called uh, TB Gold Plus. And, uh, and I will be walking you through uh, some of the early development, the goals uh, that we had in front of us in, in developing this product uh, and some of the latest research that's uh, coming out uh, as it's being uh, used uh, independently around the world. So just a, a reminder for those that are, uh, are new to the uh, Quantifuron uh, lineup of diagnostics for, for TB. Uh, it's, it, this, these products are, are not uh, directly uh, diagnostics for, for tuberculosis infection. Uh, they are aids uh, that provide uh, information on the uh, immune response uh, that can be used in conjunction with other uh, information to make uh, clinical judgments as to uh, the infection uh, status of, of the patient. So a little bit of background about tuberculosis. When somebody is exposed to TB uh, via uh, aerosols, uh, a number of things can happen. In the majority of cases, uh, the person is able to um, eradicate the infection and, uh, and will never develop active disease. However, in some cases, people become uh, uh, ill and uh, develop uh, TB fairly rapidly. Usually the highest risk is within the first uh, one to two years uh, after uh, being infected. And then for the majority of people that are infected, they will remain asymptomatic uh, for years and, and continue with the condition that we call latent TB infection. And the real puzzle uh, that we all have to deal with is that it's very difficult to understand what outcome is going to happen after this exposure. But what we do know is that the immune system plays a, a, a very uh, important role in, in, in determining this outcome. And so when we think about uh, diagnostics, uh, there is a, a, a number of ways in which we can look at the immune system to give us information about uh, responses to pathogens. And more commonly in diagnostics, we rely on the humoral uh, immune response or antibodies. Uh, but in the case of, of quantifuron, we rely on cell-mediated immunity uh, T cells, and particularly uh, a cytokine called gamma interferon. And this has really become somewhat synonymous with cell-mediated immunity. 
And it's a very good biomarker to use uh, for TB because it's very important in terms of the control of tuberculosis infection, but also that it's a very stable uh, uh, cytokine, and it's, it's often not present in, in uh, normal uh, situations. So it has a very good signal-to-noise ratio. And when you look at the spectrum of, of TB in, in infection, uh, it, it, it goes from this exposure through to infection, and, and then the bacteria is able to uh, replicate, and, and then the immune response kicks in and can either control that infection, establishing that latent infection, or at some point succumb, and, and this proliferation of bacteria uh, is somewhat uncontrolled, and you can go on to active TB disease. And importantly, uh, during these periods of, of very low uh, bacterial load, you can detect an immune response uh, via gamma interferon, uh, whereas you need much higher burdens typically uh, in order to, to detect the bacteria directly or the humoral response. And when you compare our test methodology to uh, the traditional skin test, uh, they're very similar in the, in the sense that they are looking at cell-mediated immunity uh, to the bacterial uh, antigens, except that one is done in vivo by injection of material under the skin, and then the cytokines uh, drive an inflammatory response, and you can measure that via the uh, establishment of uh, the, uh, of the uh, reaction. Whereas with our test, it's an in vitro test, and we're able to directly measure the secretion of these cytokines after exposure uh, to, to the specific antigens. And it's really, uh, it's remarkable that this skin test has, has been around for so long. It was first in the early 1900s and, and really uh, has served us well, uh, but, but certainly has some drawbacks, particularly around how do you measure it? Uh, is it in dur duration or is it the uh, erythema? And this requires two visits, one for the injection and then two to three days later to come back and measure this response. And it can be very subjective in terms of, of trying to understand you know, exactly where to start and where, where to stop. And when you compare uh, the uh, positive rates that, that you get with, uh, with our skin, with the skin test versus quantifuron. It, it's quite uh, remarkable, uh, the difference. And, and this is really a, a synopsis of that. And, and it was the largest screening study done uh, to date. And this was in China, a very high burden country in which uh, BCG vaccination is, is uh, compulsory. And uh, what, what we could see is that the, the positive rate was uh, ten percent lower and and really this is something that that goes to the the, the real power of our test over this uh, the traditional skin test and also points to really our understanding of TB prevalence uh, because a lot of our estimates about TB infection have really come from prevalence studies using the skin test uh, which has this issue with uh, with cross reaction to the, the the vaccine. And that was really where we had started when we're talking about the evolution of quantifuron. Uh, this was uh, in the early 90s, uh, was the first commercially available quantifuron test. And it was very much an in vitro skin test. We used largely the same antigens that are uh, injected under the skin, as in the case of, of, of the skin test. And then later, uh, first registered in 2004, was really the first big step uh, in terms of, of, of the quantifuron evolution. And this was when we replaced these very nonspecific uh, PPDs uh, with very specific antigens uh, that were not present in the vaccine strains for, for BCG. And so now, by measuring an immune response to these very specific antigens, we're able to differentiate an immune response to TB complex organisms uh, over vaccine. So this really allowed us to get that very high specificity that is uh, so important for quantifuron. And then we, we continue to innovate with our third generation uh, registered in, in, uh, with the US FDA in 2007. And this is when we, 
we really converted the uh, in vitro test from a, a, a purely uh, a lab-based test to one that uh, that could be deployed remotely via the uh, coding of of the antigens onto these blood collection tubes, and now it allowed us to draw the the blood uh, and and stimulate that those blood cells remotely. And because we're using standard phlebotomy and standard uh, blood collection tubes, it's really something that was able to be uh, uh, scaled uh, and allow us to now sell uh, over 30 million tests uh, uh, since then. And, and really a, a, a good reason as to why this is one of the best studied uh, uh, TB tests that there is now with uh, over 1,100 uh, publications. And and it's been, a, I mean, it's been a very uh, useful addition, particularly around the, the performance. But when we put this into the context of, of the, the, the spectrum of TB, as we start from exposure in which the infection could be eliminated through to uh, the, the development of active TB disease, really the skin test and tests like ours, interferon gamma release assays, or IGRAs, giving you that, that value of a positive or a negative is really only one piece of the puzzle, which is why we, we, our intended use is, is so much uh, uh, reliant on additional information, uh, where you can look at, the, at the, the individual in terms of their risk factors, do they have symptoms, and, and what other information uh, do, can we bring to help us understand at what point they are. Do they, are they likely to have a latent infection, or are they uh, uh, subclinical? or have incipient TB, as they, as they call this, and, and really help to uh, provide information to clinicians to, to make those decisions on whether or not to treat at all, or to go down a preventative uh, treatment strategy, or to go with a more aggressive multidrug therapy in the, in the setting of uh, active uh, or incipient TB. So really, we, we knew we had a, a great test uh, by the third generation, but we understood that this challenge that was facing uh, clinicians uh, was one in which we could add uh, a more value. And so we, we really had to think hard about how we could possibly improve upon our test and, and really uh, came up with a, a few uh, desired characteristics in terms of our, our fourth generation. And we knew that, of course, we had to maintain that high specificity, but we felt that looking at places where we can improve sensitivity would be important. And as it's an immune-based test, felt that in the, in the settings of, of, of the immunocompromised, those would be a, a great uh, place to start. And as we had seen, this uh, challenge that faces uh, clinicians in terms of understanding how to deal with, with TB and the patient, we understood that, that people were already starting to look to our test for more information in order to help them form some algorithms to, to understand how to uh, treat and, and deal with patients better. So these risk-based algorithms uh, were, were being deployed. And, uh, and so we really thought, you know, what other information could we, would, could we give to help clinicians with this, with this challenge? And because we're a, a global player, uh, we'd seen over the years that there was uh, a lot of uh, uh, different demands in, in, in terms of workflow and some uh, standardization that could, could be uh, brought to bear so that we're all using the same test globally. And so we, uh, we did some initial uh, work in terms of, 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 of looking at how to improve the, the, the performance. And uh, here's some uh, very early proof of concept studies in which we were able to to really, t we went out to try and target some high risk groups, particularly HIV uh, positive subjects. And, and here's just a snapshot of some of the, uh, the, the study data uh, in which we were able to show that with, um, with QFT plus in the setting of HIV, we were able to see uh, you know, somewhat of an improvement uh, uh, in, in that setting. And importantly, uh, we did not uh, lose specificity. And I'll walk you through a little bit how we, how we designed this uh, here. So in terms of the, the new product format, the detection of gamma interferon is, is really unchanged. It's an immunoassay. It's an ELISA-based uh, format in which we, we detect uh, gamma interferon. 
And uh, but what we changed was our blood stimulation tube. So if you noted during that previous slide, there was three tubes, and so we have added a, a fourth tube. And our format contains uh, four four tubes. The first one being a, a nil tube, which really has no antigens in there at all, and that serves as our negative control and allows us to understand the background level of of gamma interferon. Uh, and then by with TB1 and TB2, these are our antigen-containing tubes. And in the TB1 tube, we put in peptides that are designed uh, primarily to stimulate uh, CD4, uh, positive T cells. Uh, and in our TB2 tube, we combine peptides that are uh, designed to stimulate both CD4 and CD8. And our positive control is a very generic stimulant, uh, PHA mitogen. And uh, this, this serves uh, as, a, as a control that says that the handling of the tubes and, and the blood was correct and, and that the person is, is capable of mounting a, a gamma interferon uh, immune response. And we also uh, brought in uh, new uh, workflows, uh, the single uh, tube collection in which you can collect the blood. Uh, and we allowed for this to take place up to 48 hours if you transport the blood at four degrees. So very flexible workflow uh, outlined here. And so it's really the same simple uh, system that has allowed us to, to really uh, grow this test uh, around the world. And now with an additional workflow option in which we can collect blood directly into those four blood collection tubes, mix them with the stimulants that are pre-coded on those tubes, um, incubate them to allow them to make that gamma interferon uh, to the stimulants pre-coded in those tubes and then measure that amount of gamma interferon uh, in an ELISA, calculate the results, and then, um, and then al allow the doctors to, uh, to uh, make that interpretation and, uh, and, and understand how to use this and, and treat the patients. And the alternative uh, new option is to do this in a single tube collection uh, and, and transport that blood to, to a laboratory where the, the blood can be transferred to these four tubes. And so when we look at the uh, amount of gamma interferon that we, we uh, utilize to call a positive or a negative, we went with a very conservative algorithm. And so if we, we say that if there is 0.35 international units of gamma interferon above background in either the TB1 or the TB2 tube, and the positive control can be any, uh, any level, we call that positive. Uh, and Conversely, if both the TB1 and TB2 gamma interferon levels are below that threshold uh, we, and the positive control works, we call that negative. And if our positive control uh, doesn't uh, get above the threshold of 0.5 international units above background and, uh, and the, the person would otherwise be uh, negative, we call that indeterminate. And that really is there to say that we, we can't make a determination in terms of the likelihood of, of TB infection. So the big question that we get is, so why did we go down the path of, of looking at, at adding CD8 uh, antigens, and, and, and why did we go from a three-tube format up to a four-tube format? And just a little bit of background on CD4 and CD8. So CD4 T cells uh, are uh, very important in terms of cell-mediated immunity. And they're really the helper cells to uh, the adaptive immune response, including CD T cells. And these, C these CD4 cells uh, recognize peptides that are presented in the context of MHC class two. And this is uh, on specialized antigen presenting cells. And these are really the drivers of the immune response. And CD8 T cells, on the other hand, are very specialized and they uh, uh, recognize peptides that are shorter in length and presented in the context of MHC class one. And these cells are uh, kill, uh, killer, are known as killer cells. And by uh, recognizing these peptides on the, on the surface of, of, our, of our cells, they're, they, um, they're able to recognize where an intercellular pathogen is present and, uh, and, and then uh, able to uh, help to eradicate that infection. And, it should, and it's no uh, surprise that, um, that they're important in TB 
uh, because TB is, a, in, is an intracellular pathogen. And there's a lot of in, uh, evidence out there uh, that, that CD8 T cells are very important, uh, that it's, they've been shown to suppress the, the tuberculosis bacterial growth, they actually uh, recognize more highly infected cells, and they're also able to directly lyse uh, uh, tuberculosis bacteria. And it's also a, a good way to think about CD8 T cells as uh, somewhat of a, a biomarker for intracellular burden. They're there as the bacteria numbers uh, increase, uh, it's more likely to then see CD8 T cells. And this is why when, when they've been studied, they've, they've been uh, more frequently detected in those later stages of infection when bacterial burden is, uh, is increased, such as in the setting of active disease, and also early when those, that bacteria is replicating before the immune response is able to get on top and control it. And, uh, and then, not surprising, where the CD4 T cells have been compromised, such as the setting of HIV, uh, they've also been more readily detected. And, and in terms of young children, they also seem to have a very special role in the immunology of TB in young children. And because they are a biomarker for, for intracellular burden, uh, they've also been noted to decline once uh, people are on treatment uh, and in indicating that the bacterial burden is being uh, uh, reduced. And so when you put that into this picture now, uh, what we can say is that, yes, we'll still have our, our uh, information coming from, from the, the results of the test of negative and positive, but now by bringing in uh, the addition of information associated with where CD8 T cells uh, could be present, uh, this uh, can now give us uh, uh, further uh, insights into the stage, stage of, the, of the disease and particularly as it relates to um, burden. And our test is, is, uh, is uh, measuring gamma interferon in ELISA, and on its own, it, it, it can't detect where that gamma interfer interferon is coming from. So if we really want to get insights into CD4 and, and CD8 T cell immunity in and of itself, it's not really a well-suited assay to, to do that. And you would tend to have to use more complicated uh, uh, systems such as LSPOD or intracellular cytokine staining with flow cytometry or using tetramers with uh, MHC in order to get uh, you know, some specific uh, uh, understanding of what T cells are producing uh, the cytokine. And so when we looked at, at, uh, at our system, what we were able to do was by the addition of the fourth two uh, and by having different stimulants within those two uh, tubes, we were able to get a lot more information uh, out of the system. And I'll just walk you through this. So on the uh, left-hand axis there, we have the level of gamma interferon. And when we look in patients uh, in, in some of the early development uh, work, who you would say would be highly likely to have uh, a, a latent tuberculosis infection. They've been uh, IGRA positive uh, for many years and, and very healthy and, uh, and uh, unlikely to, to progress to active, uh, active disease. In that setting, these tubes really acted like replicates. And it wasn't until we really went into these higher burden and higher risk settings, and particularly uh, in the case of, of active disease, that we were able to see quite a, a, a different uh, response. And we were able to see that in that setting, when we looked at the level of gamma interferon that was being produced to the uh, C4 optimized peptides alone, uh, it tended to be lower than the, the, the level that when we had both the the longer and the shorter peptides together for CD4 and CD8 T cell stimulation. So this now gave us a very simple way of, of coming up with a biomarker for CD8 T cell in, involvement. And so we took this test forward into uh, clinical validation. And as I was showing in that, that study, uh, that, that sl those slides before, it's, it's quite a challenge to understand TB infection, and there really is no gold standard uh, for, for a, a chronic or latent tuberculosis infection. And so it's really only in, in terms of understanding the sensitivity that we, we have to go to active disease because there we can actually detect 
the bacteria directly uh, via culture and, uh, and, and say, yes, these are, are definitely people who are infected. So, so really we have to get an approximation of sensitivity uh, in that group. And then specificity, again, because we can't definitively say that somebody is not infected, all we can do is go into to, uh, uh, groups in which they really have no uh, risk factors uh, identified for, uh, for TB infection, and they're, they're healthy. And, and uh, so in that setting, we, we just uh, uh, assign anyone who comes up as positive as, as a false positive. And so we, we did numerous studies for sensitivity approximation around the world. And what we're able to show is that we had a very high sensitivity in, uh, in, in these studies. Uh, 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 sorry, this is specificity. Uh, sorry, we, we maintained our specificity uh, in, in uh, multiple sites around the world uh, and really showed that that first uh, important uh, milestone of not compromising uh, specificity uh, was achieved. Uh, and, uh, and what we were also able to do was, as I said originally, we had multiple ways in which we could look at the algorithm for interpretation. We went with the conservative uh, algorithm for sensitivity in which we would take uh, a test above the threshold in either tube. But what we were able to do in this cohort of, of very low risk individuals is to say, what would, it, what would the results be if we were to take a very conservative uh, algorithm forward in terms of false positives? And what, in that setting, what we would say is that both tubes uh, would need to be uh, positive. And so we provided this an analysis for, for information. And, and what can be seen here is that if we look at the number of positives in this very low risk setting uh, here, uh, we saw that we had uh, 20 uh, positives uh, that were uh, identified by the conservative uh, algorithm for specificity. And this was reduced down to eight once you took this more conservative algorithm into consideration. And so uh, about 60% of the false positives were able to be uh, identified uh, when, when taking uh, very low risk uh, uh, profiles into consideration. And then in terms of sensitivity, uh, we did a number of studies uh, around the world and, and really showed that, uh, that we have a, a, a very uh, high sensitivity uh, in excess of 94% and that by using this very conservative uh, algorithm for interpretation, we were able to identify uh, nine uh, positives via the TB2 only. Uh, and uh, three that would have been indeterminate if they had been interpreted by uh, the TB1 only. So in, in the setting of high risk and active uh, disease, uh, we were able to improve the sensitivity of the test with the uh, addition of the, the two-tube format and, and particularly the CD8 uh, antigens. In our mixed risk population, uh, when we compared our, our new version to the old version, uh, we had very good uh, concordance between the two with a, a, an agreement uh, in excess of 98% uh, uh, positive uh, agreement and, and in excess of 99% uh, uh, with negative um, uh, uh, agreement. And when you looked uh, with QFT+, plus, there was a few more positives, but of course this, this was not significant. And what we were also to, able to, to show was when we go back to looking at the levels of gamma interferon in the different tubes, so, and subtracting away now the TB1 value, so that's with the CD4 optimized peptides alone, or the combination with TB2, uh, we were able to now get a surrogate for this isolated CD8 response. And what we saw was that this uh, increased level of, of gamma interferon in the presence of the CD8 peptides uh, was more pronounced as we went up in terms of uh, risk uh, category. So in the very low risk, the tubes tended to act more like replicates. In the mixed risk, we started to see uh, higher levels of gamma interferon, and in the active uh, set setting out uh, many more patients showing this uh, biomarker for CD8 T cell involvement. So of course, uh, when we can take uh, th this information into the context of risk, 
now we have uh, another piece of, uh, of important information uh, along with uh, how, how concordant these two tubes are. So uh, the, the million dollar questions then are, uh, are these good biomarkers for recent infection in, in, in the setting of these mixed risk populations? And, and really, how does this uh, help us to inform uh, clinical practice? And so we knew that, uh, that there was a, a lot of work to be done and, and that independent studies were really uh, critical in terms of, of understanding the value proposition here with our, our next generation test. And so we, we supported a, a very large clinical program, uh, now in excess of 30,000 patients. And we did this by providing uh, free kits or discounted kits and really allowed the independent investigations to get uh, access to the test and, and determine uh, its utility uh, in their uh, various uh, research uh, settings. And, and the first independent evaluation uh, was published in 2016. And, and this study uh, really uh, highlighted uh, that, they, that they saw, uh, importantly, this maintenance of the high specificity, 97%. And, and very high sensitivity of, of 88 uh, percent in active uh, TB settings. And importantly, uh, they had a very uh, small number of HIV co-infected, and all 100 uh, percent of those uh, TB uh, HIV co-infected subjects were, were, were picked up. They also were able to show a, a reasonable uh, correlation with, uh, with uh, quantifiron uh, of 94 percent in a subset of these patients. And, and really, I think what was, I guess, the first study, and, and it was really great to see uh, this, uh, this validation of the uh, TB2 and TB1 uh, signal, uh, in which they were able to show that in the setting of smear positive uh, TB, they were able to, to see, see this uh, difference uh, uh, significantly uh, uh, more often uh, as compared to smear negative TB patients, and, and really uh, also validate uh, this this, this setting of, of, uh, of it being a biomarker for CD8 uh, T cell involvement uh, by uh, utilizing one of those much more uh, 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 difficult uh, uh, settings of flow cytometry to identify that CD8 T cells were in fact um, uh, stimulated uh, in this setting. And, and they're, they're very early. Uh, involvement uh, with, uh, with uh, HIV co-infection and, and really seeing that, that they, they were able to pick up uh, everybody with, uh, with uh, HIV uh, co-infection, uh, really suggesting that there was value in terms of, of bringing in CD8 T cells uh, in the setting of, of, of HIV. And, and there was further work then looking at this, whole, this CD4, CD8 signal and, and the setting of disease. And again, uh, really showing that this, this uh, CD8 T cell involvement uh, was much more pronounced uh, in, the, in the, um, the setting of, uh, of uh, more of a, a high severity tuberculosis. And, uh, and again, uh, really uh, backing up that, that there was uh, quite a distinct difference between uh, uh, the controlled uh, uh, infection and, and really uh, and not seeing this uh, CD8 T cell signature uh, as much as in the setting of, of active, uh, active disease. And one of the studies that has really, I think, set, uh, set the world uh, 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 interest uh, uh, on fire somewhat is, uh, is that was the first study done in contacts. And, and this study uh, was, was, uh, was done in uh, 119 skin test positive uh, contacts, and they compared quantifiron the third generation to the, the new quantifiron plus, and were able to show uh, that their, uh, these skin test positives were very heavily uh, impacted, uh, most likely by uh, uh, the, this, the um, uh, BCG vaccination, and that 63 uh, of these individuals were, were negative by QFT. However, 12 of these uh, uh, QFT negatives uh, were, were picked up as positives with, with QFT plus. And when they looked a little deeper at these, uh, they were able to, uh, to, to show that uh, th these weren't just uh, you know, five millimeter skin test positives. These were 
uh, greater than 10 millimeter uh, skin test positives. And they were able to retest uh, some of these individuals, and two of them actually uh, converted to uh, quantifiron positive after 10 to 12 weeks. And these were both initially positive by uh, QFT Plus, with, which indicated that QFT Plus was able to pick these up uh, a little bit uh, earlier. And when they then started to look at multivariate uh, analysis, they were able to show that uh, being QFT Plus uh, positive had a stronger risk association with um, aggregate exposure time to the um, uh, index case and, uh, and um, proximity uh, uh, to the index case. And I'll, and I'll show you a little bit more about this here. Uh, because when they then broke that down even further and said, what about this CD8 uh, uh, biomarker, this difference between the TB2 gamma interferon level and the TB1 gamma interferon level, they chose a, a value of 0.6 international units per mil difference. And they showed that this biomarker now was significantly associated with proximity to the index case, in fact, uh, sleeping in the same room, and also that it was associated with being of European origin, uh, which was much more of a, an indication that these uh, um, individuals uh, were, were not uh, um, likely to have been infected uh, for a long period of time. So really suggesting that this new test format could be a proxy for recent infection. And this got WHO uh, interested in the test, and, and in their uh, 2016 TB report, they actually specifically called out QFT Plus and mentioned this study uh, as it really uh, was a, the first indicator that, that this CD8 T cell uh, signature uh, may be able to identify people at greater risk of progression to active TB. Uh, because, uh, as we said earlier, that recent infection, uh, that risk for progression is really the highest within the first one to two years. And just going a little bit further uh, into the, the, the notion that CD8 uh, T cells are a biomarker for, for bacterial burden, there was a study published looking at, at the outcomes during treatment. And, and this was quite interesting, where you're looking at the amount of gamma interferon that is being produced at, uh, at zero months, three months, or six months uh, uh, post-treatment, and, and showing really that the, the TB1 or the CD4 uh, targeted uh, signature declined somewhat at three months, but then really leveled off over six months, and TB2 also declined at, at, at each point. But really the only thing that was significant was the difference between those two tubes, so that CD8 uh, uh, signature of TB1 minus 2 was able to decline uh, at each time point, and this was significant uh, at, the, at the later time points. So really suggesting that the, that the difference between these two tubes could be a, a, a biomarker for burden and, and hence treatment uh, um, efficacy. Now I'd also sort of talked a little bit about the single tube and here was an example of, of a setting in which uh, patients uh, in, in the UK, uh, about 4,615 4, uh, patients were, were, had their blood collected with a single tube, and they had been having some issues in terms of, of some of their remote sites really you know, handling the, the blood, and, and so they, they were getting indeterminants uh, a little bit higher than what they would expect, and so they really wanted to see if the single tube uh, setting could help them in terms of, of bringing that control back into a central facility. And what they were able to show was that, uh, that they were able to bring that indeterminate rate down to 0.2%, uh, which was uh, uh, you know, something quite remarkable. Uh, and we'd also done a lot of work in terms of the formulation and, and how we produce our manufacture our tubes, and, and we felt that this would really help in terms of overall consistency and reproducibility of the test, and, and we did see a, a study uh, published in which they looked at the um, precision of the new test and showed that the, uh, the CVs on, uh, on, on, the, on the test was, was really uh, a half of what it was uh, with the previous generation really suggesting that this could add value, particularly as you get uh, levels around that cut point. And 
as I'd mentioned, in terms of specificity, it's 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 very important to us uh, uh, in the in the setting of, of healthcare workers, and and we had uh, identified this uh, alternative analysis, and and what we see now is is publications uh, coming out now looking at 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 this in the setting of of healthcare worker screening, and we're able to. Uh, to look at um, at the the specificity in these healthcare workers with that have no identifiable risk factors uh, and and had not had uh, uh, at least self-reported positive uh, LTBI tests in the past, and what they were able to show was that um, that their their positive rate uh, fell from three percent uh, down to one percent when you would use this conservative interpretation uh, in which you would require them to be positive by both TB1 and TB2 tubes. So very similar to what we saw in our specificity studies. And what they were also able to do was to, to show uh, that when they retested uh, these, these individuals that they had a high, uh, a high uh, likelihood of retesting negative. So effectively now with, uh, with, the, with QFT plus with this addition of the extra tube in this low risk setting, you now have more information that could be applied to help you with the identifying uh, false positives. And as I said, one of our goals was really to look at the performance uh, of the test in the setting of, of, of uh, the immunocompromised, and we've now seen the first uh, patient uh, uh, populations of HIV in the setting of HIV co-infection published and this was done in Zambian patients, and uh, and they were uh, 108 um, uh, positive uh, pulmonary TB uh, sub subjects, and with 68 being HIV positive and 40 uh, HIV negative. And when you, when you looked at the uh, overall sensitivity of the test, one of the, the key differences here was really that um, with TFT plus, there was no difference in terms of the sensitivity. So we got a very high level of sensitivity. So let me get this pointer here. Uh, here, 80% in the setting of, of, of HIV negative uh, and 85% in the setting of, of, um, of being HIV positive. So uh, very, very good data. And, and very different to what their experience was with QFT, our previous version, in which there was a 21% difference in terms of sensitivity uh, in the setting of, of HIV status, very similar to what we saw in those proof of concept studies. They were then also able to look at the sensitivity as they stratified by CD4 T cell count and really showed that there was, did not seem to be an impact on sensitivity uh, with QFT plus until you got below uh, 100 um, uh, uh, CD4 T cells, uh, in which the, uh, the sensitivity dropped to 50 percent, and this is really again in, in, in stark contrast to what their experience was with QFT, in which it, it, it was impacted at uh, quite dramatically at, at in counts uh, less than 100, dropping to 23 percent. So, uh, really. Um, uh, uh, promising data in, in the setting of HIV and, and, and the improvements that, that these uh, CD8 T cells uh, uh, can bring. So when we think back to, to what everybody uh, wanted uh, in terms of the new test, uh, this, we had to keep that high specificity and really you know, bring, bring forward some improved uh, sensitivity, particularly in the setting of, of immunocompromised really understanding uh, how, how we could add more information in terms of risk-based algorithms and, and as I was showing you in the setting of contacts, really you know, being able to identify uh, potential uh, uh, recent infection and then, uh, and then really you know, the, the big question going forward is, is how does this uh, help us in terms of prediction of, of disease progression. And so overall, there's, a, there's already a, a, you know, a number of, of publications out. Uh, I walked you through, walked you through uh, uh, several of those, but, um, but more and more are coming out uh, in terms of, of, of looking at uh, validating both the sensitivity 
uh, and uh, specificity uh, being specificity being unimpacted, sensitivity certainly being uh, very very uh, very high, uh, and and then in terms of contacts, really identifying that that CDH signal is being associated with uh, uh, exposure risk and uh, and uh, proxy for recent infection, uh, HIV uh, co-infection, really showing that the sensitivity was not impacted by HIV status. And then, uh, the, again, back to the biomarker of, of bacterial burden, uh, showing that this CD8 signature declining uh, during treatment, uh, and, and, and then looking at our laboratory workflows and, and the potential improvements there with, uh, with the precision. So as I said, there's a, a large number of studies. Uh, really, uh, the big uh, studies in terms of looking at progression take quite a period, a period of time. Uh, so we're a couple of years into these studies now. So, so stay tuned in terms of more publications coming out, uh, examining the, the, the impact of, of the new test. And, uh, but really, you know, we're, we're quite uh, uh, happy with, with uh, performance so far with the sensitivity now uh, around 94% in, in uh, uh, active pulmonary uh, uh, TB and really maintaining that specificity that's a hallmark of our, of our quantifiron test and, and really showing now that bringing in this new C8 T cell technology uh, with independent studies really showing how the CD8 T cell involvement uh, can can uh, bring information relevant to new infection and, and the burden of TB. But of course, you know, we, we really look forward to uh, more research coming out now to, to look at uh, at where this uh, information can be applied. And uh, and ultimately, we continue to innovate, improve the manufacturing, and, and really our, our goal is to get robust and reliable uh, results out there. Uh, and, and and for all the settings that this test is uh, put to uh, globally. So uh, thank you very much for that, and, uh, and I am uh, happy to take some questions. Thank you, Dr. Boyle, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window. Type your question into the box that appears on your screen and click on the send button. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for. So let's get started with our first question. Our first question of the day asks, does QFT plus distinguish between active and latent TB? Okay, do I have control? I... All right. um, so yes, so I'd say our test is not intended as, a, as something that will, would be used in, in that setting, but as we saw, uh, there is a, 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 a tendency now for, for there to be a, a higher detection of the CD8 T cell involvement in the setting of active disease, but, but really uh, we, we feel that uh, uh, much more research is, is really needed in terms of, of applying it to that setting. Thank you for your answer. Our second question asks, why was specificity so important? Uh, yes, yeah, so as, as I said throughout the talk, specificity is, is, is really critical to our test. And it's really because our test is, is used as a, as a um, as a, a, a screening tool in a setting often of very low risk uh, individuals in low burden settings. And so here, uh, even having a, a specificity of, of 97, 98% can lead to a two or 3% false positive rate uh, in which in those settings, uh, most of your, uh, um, of your uh, positives are, are, are going to be false positives. So really 
trying to uh, keep that uh, specificity as high as possible will reduce the burden on, on people in terms of, of understanding uh, uh, you know, what to do with, with these individuals and, and, and really helping them to target uh, treatment uh, appropriately. Thank you. Our next question of the day asks, why combine CD4 and CD8 if you are interested in CD8 only? Okay, great, thanks. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a very common question. And it really came down to what we saw during the development and really what is underlying uh, the, the innovation in QFT Plus. And it was really that in, in the combination of both these long peptides and the short peptides, we were able to see a synergy uh, that took place between the CD4 uh, and the CD8 and, and, and allowed us then to see this signal in, in, in many more individuals than we would have had we just gone down the path of, of using the, the CD8 only approach. And since we have some time constraints, to, uh, this will be the last question of the day. And this question asks, do you still need the four tubes if the single tu tube blood collection is used? Yes, so the single tube collection is, is now an option uh, that, that we provide. And so what we do in that setting is that the four tubes uh, don't need to be present at the, the time of blood collection, uh, but it allows the, the uh, lab or the, the, the um, phlebotomist to, at, at an, a time of their own choosing, to then transfer that blood to the other tubes, uh, either remotely or in the laboratory. Uh, and, and really just provides flexibility in terms of the patient uh, and, uh, and the number of tubes uh, available at, at the site. I would like to once again thank Dr. Boyle for his presentation. I would also like to thank Kyogen for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through February of 2018. You will be emailed uh, from LabRoots letting you know when the webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us, and we hope to see you again here soon at LabRoots. Goodbye. <laughs>